If the Browns quarterback jersey is one end of the spectrum, opening day Cleveland starting pitchers is definitely the other. I'm TJ, that's Zach. Welcome to the Selby is Godcast. If you're a member of our Discord, there's always something going on in there. And I popped in there the other day. I want to give some love to our friend Shoeless Joe Schmo. You familiar with his work? Shoeless Joe Schmo noted something that it wasn't mind blowing, but in a way it was. Because I knew Cleveland only had two opening day starters over the past decade, but I hadn't put it into those terms mentally. And so you have one of those aha moments. That, yeah, I knew that it's been Bieber and before that it was Kluber. But just to put it in that, in that manner, that they've only had two opening day starters over a decade. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. So how many will they have over the next decade? That's the question. <laughs> and that's what we're here to discuss. Well, we're partially, partially here to discuss it. But I mean, it, it says a lot, not only that you have good two good pitchers in this case, where there's no question those guys are going to be starting on opening day and you have the longevity of it. But even great pitchers might miss an opening day here and there just because they're not healthy at the beginning of the year or they need, you know, heaven forbid, they needed some massive surgery. That could take them off the map for a year. But even if it's like with Gavin Williams, where he's going to miss a couple of weeks at the beginning of the season, that could have happened. It speaks to having the quality of the starting pitcher, but also just the longevity and posting, <laughs> just being there. That says something pretty splendid about their luck with opening day starters over the past decade. Yeah. And it's never in doubt, right? It was just, if you're healthy, you knew it was Kluber. If Bieber has been healthy, you've known it's going to be Bieber. Um, I, it's interesting. I, 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 I can't remember the last time there was quote unquote competition for this, right? Bieber had a really good year after 2019. Maybe that was surprising, his first time getting it going into 2020 because they still had a really good rotation. Um, but they had traded Kluber, and so that throne was vacant. And you were just... I think that, I, I, if I recall, that spring, part of it was just who was on which timetable. Clevenger would have been a contender. And I... Wasn't he... Did he get injured? Did he tweak something in spring training, maybe? Uh, these years all blend together. I'm getting old. But I feel I like just, once you get once you get the first one, though, it's... Well, yeah, you have a good in. year. Like <laughs> It's probably easier to get two, three, four, and five than it is yeah, the to manager get the first. He doesn't want to have to think about it. He just says, well, they, they've got the honor of it, and they're just going to continue that quest on being the next year and the next year. But there's something about that five years that just feels like it's the sweet spot. Now, with, with Bieber being here for the fifth year, I don't think you're going to see a sixth one. <laughs> just, just just call me crazy, but I just don't think you're going to get a sixth one here, a sixth consecutive one. Just because that five years and it lines up with this, the six years of controllability for these young pitchers. So it takes a year or two before they elevate themselves to being opening day starter status. And that's why it's tough to break through. Are we going to see anybody? Like, you have some great young starting pitching. I don't know that if, if Bybee slides in here and he's the opening day starter next year, well, I don't know that he's going to break five. So <laughs> th this might this might be the number. It may never be broken, this, Maybe this if, little stretch. If they take a pitcher with the first overall pick and then he's just so good in the minors and maybe they're – they're rebuilding and they trade Bybee and Williams in the next couple of years. So there's no what? other contenders. So they just, what? I'm trying to like to, cause you'd have they do to do that all the time. It'd have to be a the rebuilding. is just what they do. Or I guess they manipulate someone's service time. And then years two through seven, they would start opening day. Like those are the, those are the ways I don't know. What a sad exercise. I have a question for you. Okay. Bring it on. I was pondering this in my head today. Um, in part, it, it was funny. It first came to mind after watching Jose Ramirez strike out in his first at bat. And I was thinking, I feel like every time he strikes out, he walks back to the dugout thinking, God, that pitcher got lucky. Like I should have just crushed one in that at bat. That, that should never have happened. And then of course he comes up in his next at bat 
and socks one off the pavilion in right field. So I was thinking, is there a better chance that he... W- I was thinking about like what a, a bold prediction for Jose Ramirez for 2024. And I was thinking, is there a better chance he wins a batting title this season? Or that he wins MVP. And that might sound crazy or strange because you're going to say, well, if he wins MVP, isn't he going to have a good batting average? But he's not, you know, it's been a while since he was in, I mean, he finished seventh in the American League in in average last season. But he, he, it's not like he's been hitting 315 every year. He's usually 270, 280. Um, and the MVP comes from him being so well-rounded. So I'm I'm curious what you think. I keep waiting for him to have that season where he hits well, 320 yeah. because he makes so much contact. He's so good at pulling things. You can't shift anymore. I feel like I'm answering my own question. I should let you talk. Well, everyone would have their their preference, which is you would rather him win the MVP than some yeah, – who cares about a batting title – and then you get into this whole conversation of why do we still call it a batting title when it's a batting average and that's not important anymore. That aside, the 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 conversation itself about Jose and his batting average, when I when I have thought about him elevating himself to being in this MVP territory, I still don't think of him as a high average guy. And maybe it's just because be, the shifting played a role. It, it did, and because the way that he maximizes his offense, he needs to pull the ball in the air, which is great when you do it, and he's among the best in baseball at doing it. But when you're a little bit off and you just roll one over, you, you think, ah, I can, I can hook this one down the right field line, but, but you don't because you just missed it because we're all human, even Jose. You're just going to roll one over, and it's going to be an easy ground out for the second baseman, and so at times he can get a little bit easy to defend. That said, you would expect at least one year where he just runs some crazy batting average on balls in play and lucks his way into a higher average than than he typically does. So I, I don't know. It's not important, but it's March 21st. What else are we talking about? <laughs> Do you think if he was more willing to just settle for a single that that could change? I, I, I just feel like... The patience isn't always there. And I wonder if maybe last season, some of the frustrations, not just with him, but with the whole lineup, um, he learned from them and realized, you know, I got to take my walks. I got to, I got to swing at my pitch more. I think anybody is human enough to force themselves outside of a, a place where they need to be as a hitter, as a pitcher, There are extenuating circumstances at times that can impact performance. I buy it. And we can't always quantify that. For a hitter, I don't necessarily believe in, like, the protection angle of it. It gives you better pitches to hit. A team is still going to circle Jose Ramirez and say, we're not going to let that guy beat him. No matter how good the the hitter is behind him, more often than not, they're going to make that guy beat him. So there is something to it but I don't think a lot but for a hitter himself being in a lineup where you don't have a lot of protection and you don't think you're going to get a lot of pitches to hit yeah I think you would maybe expand in certain situations that you normally wouldn't and I don't even think it's a conscious thing it's not even a well I don't trust the guy behind me so I better swing at this pitch I just think subconsciously if you're not seeing a lot of great pitches to hit you do eventually because everybody likes taking a walk that's fine but at some point you want to swing the bat you want to do some damage if you're Jose Ramirez I think we have seen at times hidden him get into some bad habits even earlier I think in 23 we saw him go through some of those habits I would absolutely buy that it's easier to be within where you need to be when everybody else is pulling their weight around you I would totally believe that that's a thing it's it it doesn't take you from really bad to really good or one way or the other, but I do think it it adds just a little bit on the edges to maybe take a great season into an MVP season or even a good season into a great one or the other way around. Okay, so what's the answer? (laughs) 
what was your question again? Was it more? <laughs> what's more likely? Yeah. Why doesn't it happen? I don't. What, what was your question? Is he more likely to win the batting title or MVP? I think he's. I think he's more likely to be the MVP. Hmm. I think he's more be, just because he has so much going for him. I read a was it Fangrass or maybe it was a pitcher list. One one of these websites that do a great job thinking analytically and outside the box at times wrote a story. I think it it might have been pitcher list just about the best third baseman still in baseball and Jose still tops the list. And they said, yeah, he's probably not peak. Jose Ramirez anymore but the trek I think they as they phrased it was the trek down Mount Everest isn't just that you jump off the side of the mountain you're starting way up here and yeah it's a decline but it's a long way down to the bottom until you're cozy in a blanket somewhere and that's that's kind of what we've been saying about Jose it, as long as the cliff isn't sudden which it does happen from time to time but when you start at such a good place and you're so good at so many different things all he needs is is that one year where everything does work in the batting average on balls and play territory, and it helps push that extra 5% he needs to actually clinch the MVP. So I will buy that that's more likely than just getting the batting title. I just don't think that's the sort of hitter he is. He's not. I, I don't think of him as being batting average first. He's not that kind of guy. He was in 2016, but a long time ago. Different hitter. He to your point, he also, his stiffest competition is no longer a member of the American League. Um, so if if you're betting on Jose to win it, you don't have to worry about Shohei Otani winning it. So let's talk about <laughs> so many days. <laughs> no, I have a question for you. Who is the next opening day starter for Cleveland? We know it's Bieber this year. Tristan McKenzie. Because there is a little bit of seniority here. And if he, if all, let's say all those guys have seasons you expect them to have, then McKenzie has the seniority and he has the credentials. Eh, that's, that's a boring answer though. So but let's boring, say boring is right sometimes. That's let's say Jordan Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> boring is Corbin correct. Corbin Burns. <laughs> it's like you turn into a bracket that's all the number one seeds and all the number two seeds. And Ugh. yeah, it's boring. It's boring. But you still say these are the best teams. These are who I think is going to beat. It doesn't matter. Just draw them all out of, draw them all out of a hat. Really, it doesn't matter. It's easy to, easy for you to say. My bracket was busted three hours into the tournament. <laughs> this this coming from the man who said, why do we spend so much time looking at these first round matchups? None of this stuff <laughs> matters. Well, guess what? If you don't get the first round right, it doesn't matter who you, you picked in the second, third, beyond. It doesn't matter. So that's Can why I... you spend so much time. Because those small little outcomes mean a huge thing later on once it funnels down into wherever you get. And lo and behold, as at the time of this recording, my wife and one-year-old son are 8 and 0 oh in their bracket. <laughs> Why didn't you just copy what they did? Why didn't you do that? Yeah. That's a, that's the better way to go because if you if you're wrong, you just say, ah, "I was just I was just picking randomly, but when you're wrong and you spent hours upon hours researching, don't you feel like a total jerk? Yeah, but I also can't, the entry fee for my, the pool that I'm in every year, I can't even say the number out loud on this podcast, so I can't go into it blind. I have to do research. And yet at the end of the day, what has that gotten you? A couple of third place matches. <laughs> It does not exist, your success. Similar to the way that Kyle Manzardo's spot on the opening day roster does not exist in 2024. Not a shock. I mean, we've talked about this for 
for months at this point that it was a very real possibility that it wasn't going to open on the big league roster. Am I upset about it? Sure. Am I going to make jokes on X about it? Yeah. Does he need that three-week course in the minor leagues to work on his footwork at first base, and then he's going to be happy and ready to go? Possibly. Or is he? I'm wondering, the fact that he didn't make the opening day roster, is that going to lead to him not debuting in three weeks? Because that's a little dangerous if you think this kid is good enough to miss three weeks and still go win Rookie of the Year. You don't want to have a repeat of Tanner Bybee again, even though that's that's great. I, I would like that. But the team, having made this decision, is not going to want him to go get his full year of service time when you missed out on the first three to four weeks of the season by playing these these roster manipulation games. Do you really think Manzardo can win? Like, let's say he's called up April 18th. Do you think he could win MV- or Rookie of the Year? Jeez, MVP. Who? <laughs> Do you think Manzardo could win the batting title or MVP? Uh, I, I don't know that I would put him as the, the betting favorite. But I would say that that he's got a really good shot. Is it an uphill battle at his position? Yes. I mean, didn't we see that last year with uh, with uh, Boston's first baseman, Cassis? Didn't we see that? It can be an uphill battle for a guy at that position. I totally understand that. But I mean, there's if you're a really lot good, of competition, though. If you're really good, you're going to be in the mix. And did we say that about Bybee last year? Did we think that he was going to get called up and finish as high as he did in Rookie of the Year? Of course we didn't. So a lot plays out that it's going to be – you're going to be taking a risk if you call him up that that early. The Rangers have Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford. The A's are the A's, but like Mason Miller, like just because he could pitch a lot, like he stands a chance – um, maybe Colson Montgomery with the White Sox. I don't know. Click Colt Keith with the Tigers. He signed an extension, so he should be on the roster all year. Obviously, Jackson Holiday, Junior Camonero. Um, I mean, there are a lot of candidates. Uh, the Orioles also have like five rookie outfielders who could factor into this. Yeah, I, I mean, he he he's one of many candidates. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a handful. But the question that has existed all along is, are you trying to win? Because if you're trying to win, he's one of your best hitters. And the answer to that question shouldn't change between March 28th and April 28th. Like, you're either trying to win or you're not. A lot of the decisions they've made suggest, no, that's not the priority. You know, it's there, there's just a lot of contradictions here. It's like, well, we we aren't going to spend money because uh, we're not sure about the TV deal, and then the TV deal works out exactly how they had hoped, and then it's, well, we're not going to spend money because we want to get a look at the young kids, and then it's, well, not the young kids that you guys want to see. It's going to be this twenty year old <laughs> uh, rule five pick, and it's like, oh well. April's not kind to young hitters, but that's the environment we're going to evaluate Davis and De Los Santos in and make a decision on him. Um, that's the environment we're going to evaluate Estevan Florial in. So it's just, it's, I don't really know what the plan is and what they're trying you to do. do in 2024. Like, I think it's a you transition it year. It's the year to get final answers mark off some things on the checklist so that 2025 it's full speed ahead with a young rotation that is experienced at that point with more answers in the lineup with Manzardo and DeLauder in there and not with training wheels on with hopefully an answer in the middle infield, et cetera, et cetera. But how they're going about that in 2024 doesn't make sense. The Bieber still being on the roster then doesn't make sense. Scott Barlow's trade doesn't make sense. Um, there's a lot of things that just don't quite add up. They're, they're contradicting. So long way of saying with Manzardo, it's, I understand wanting the extra year. I totally get that. And I can't blame not even just like the small market teams, but any team 
an extra year of control, just sacrificing three weeks in the majors, like that is a huge benefit. I understand why every team tries to do that if you can. But in the AL yeah. Central, in the AL yes. Central, yes, it takes maybe 85, 86 wins. And the games in April count just as much as the games in September. And just throwing De Los Santos out there every day and hoping, hoping what happens? Like what's the best case scenario there? Knowing that it's pretty hard to roster him and Manzardo and Naylor at some point. Yeah. So are you just going to pull the plug on De Los Santos at the end of April and be like, it didn't work out. Well, Manzardo, come well, on. I think what they're doing is they're buying themselves more time. Correct. Like they're, I, and they're, I said they're that, kicking the can down the road here. Right. And I, I, I mentioned that, that last week that like that's probably what's going to happen here. But the problem with that is that you're not doing any favors to De Los Santos because it's a terrible environment to evaluate him. And it's still, with him, it's a decision for 162 games. That's the other thing, is if he's like okay in April, do you just continue it and then leave Manzardo down in AAA to rot for another month? Like, it's, you're costing yourself and you're not helping the, the players. That That's the issue I have. And yeah, like you could have talked extension and maybe if you would have agreed to an extension, then you put Manzardo on the opening day roster because the service time doesn't matter at that point. But I just don't, I don't really know how this all shakes out. Like, I don't see the scenario where it's a victory all around, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I get it from a, a team perspective of wanting to maintain a guy as long as you can. I don't agree with it in this situation, and we I have 42 different shows to point to as my exhibit A through whatever that I think that's a bad idea. And I'm not as concerned with the seventh year for him because you should be able to afford that on the back end. You should be working on an extension, if not this season, then definitely next season. And then you bet on the kid that you traded for, and you, you showcased all this desire to have him. And you traded, you know, for whatever you think of Aaron Savali, you still traded him when you had a shot at the division. So clearly you liked Manzardo. So put your money where your mouth is, or in your, in this case, where your actions were. The whole idea of, of evaluating hitters and in, in not wanting to do it in April Okay, but as you said, you are doing it with a bunch of other hitters that you're, you're trying to answer questions on. In the case of, of both De Los Santos and Floreal, those are two roster spots that if you, you move on from them, you're moving on from them for good uh, more, more often than not. So it's just a matter of, it's almost like just, well, we don't want to make this decision today. So let's make this decision again three weeks into the season, a month into the season, May 1st, whatever, and then maybe by that time, De Los Santos needs to go on the, the injured list. Floreal has absolutely sucked, and we don't care. We're just going to move on from him. It's so weird to me that they are so averse to making decisions on some people, and that others, it seems like they make decisions very quickly. And like, in the case of Nolan Jones, whether they should or should not have, it's still real quick that they just said, we're on, we're gone, we're done. Whether they're right or wrong, it's more of a, I can't believe they, they did that as quick as they did. That's kind of shocking. And we've said at the time, it's, well, maybe it's just because they like Brito as much as they do. And maybe that was the case. But there's some, they're like so petrified they're going to make the wrong call with one of these shortstops. And then in, the other, in, in, in some other cases, they just let guys go very quickly way before maybe even they should. And and Antonetti has even stated that they need to be more patient with some players. He said that earlier this spring. So it's a little bit of a disconnect in how you treat some players in other cases. You, I don't know. It doesn't always line up. It's the, the hardest thing about baseball is that sometimes it takes years to get answers. So, so when you're, re, you're evaluating whatever your process is, Let's say you're evaluating your scouting process. Okay. By the time the players either make it to the majors and thrive or fizzle out in the minors and you get your answer, it's four or five years and you're going back and changing what you did four or five years ago and four or five years later, things might have changed to where 
what you're changing them to, like you, it, you actually might have been on the right track. And then it's so much of it is, is it our fault? Is it the player's fault? Um, is it coaching? Like it, it's really difficult to pull this off. There are plenty of teams who do it, but I feel like they were making changes to their hitting development process and how they evaluated players. And in 2022, things went, everything went right. And it was like, whoa, we weren't even anticipating this. Okay, 2023, let's pretty much run it back. And they made some bad front office, maybe rush judgments because they had arrived quick, more quickly than they thought. They hitched their wagon to the wrong horses. And Don't look do what it. happened last no, year. No more of this. <laughs> they hitched no their more horses horse racing, to the... No. <laughs> they hitched their horses and fell off the wagon. Um, <laughs> Nobody wants and that. And so, so I just I I think it's almost caused. It was like 2022, like okay, we've got our hitting development process where we want it. Like we're scouting the right talent. We're we're getting all these kids up here, and they're having some success. And we won 92 games. We didn't expect that. Okay, but like everything's great. And then 2023, it was like, wait, nope backtrack things aren't great and now it's like ah shit we can't make those same mistakes again but were we actually onto something in 2022 or did we just like was it fluky and so i it's really difficult to just evaluate in real time and because of that i i think i think it's better to err on the side of caution with things but you can't err on the side of caution when you stockpile 79 shortstops and and I think the De Los Santos thing was them feeling desperation to add power. And they weren't going to add power via free agency. They have not made this imaginary trade that even they have admitted they need to make for multiple years where they consolidate some of this middle infield t- prospect talent. And so one way to add some power to the organization was to grab a kid in the Rule 5 draft. The problem is... It's having so many ramifications on the rest of the roster because to keep him around and pray that in like three years he can hit 25 home runs for you, you can't option him. You can't do any, like he takes up a spot on your roster. That might cost David Fry or Will Brennan time in the majors this year. It certainly, it's already costing Kyle Manzardo time in the majors. So it's just the pieces don't fit and they're, the reasoning for why they're choosing certain pieces or why certain pieces are here to begin with is they are so afraid to make another mistake because they uncharacteristically made some because they they completely misread where they were each of the last two years. I think one of the biggest elements of my frustration is I my feeling about where they're at doesn't match where I mentally believe they actually are at. And I'm trying to reason how I I work that out. But when I think about this team, there's just some like, I don't know, bad vibes or something I can't get past. It's it's just an outlook. I don't know what it is, but it's it's not a a hopeful sort of projection for the way this is going to go. And yet, when I stop and think about it, I love where this team is going to be at. Maybe even as soon as halfway through this year with Manzardo, with maybe the Lauder, where we're going to talk about him in a, in a few minutes where I think this lineup is going to be in 25. We talked about it in past shows. My goodness, I can't wait for 2025. <laughs> I think the, uh, And to have a rotation like this. So my frustration is, when I look at a team like this that has this, so much young talent and this young rotation talent and some young players that I'm actually excited to watch position player-wise, that doesn't match with the way that I feel about the way the season is going to play out. I have been asked so many times over the last few weeks, just, is this team going to be good? And I stare back at the person, whoever it is, like they just told me, like they just read me the first 50 numbers in pie. Like, I, I, I'm just, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. My, my, my son can do that. He was singing a song <laughs> earlier. Apparently there's a song that goes with it. I don't know. I just look at the person like they have seven heads. I, I don't, I have no idea. I don't know. I think they have a really strong nucleus. I think they have no depth. And I think they are relying on so many young players to break out. But the play, young players who have the best chances of breaking out have to wait behind the not quite as young 
players who don't have as good of a chance of breaking out and how they navigate this and get to the lineup that I'm envisioning in my head that has Manzardo or DeLauder and or the maybe really Brito young. or Rocchio or Martinez or Tana or whoever. I don't know how they get there. And I still think somehow, whether it's making a trade or dipping your toes into free agency a little bit next winter, you still need to add some supplemental pieces. Even if Manzardo and Delauder hit and they look great, like you need more depth pitching wise and position player wise. All of that said, like I, I what I don't know and what I hope to gain some clarity on is the like an honest self evaluation by the front office on what this team should be. Like how do they really think like can they win ninety games? Do they think they can? Are they? Would they just say they can't? Like they, I know they always say, "Oh, well, we're always trying to compete," but mm. there have been so many conflicting decisions that I don't well, know where they think they stand. What is what is that even worth, though, to to get where they think they are? Because in twenty two, they told us they didn't think they were that team as late as the trade deadline, because they didn't make that big move. Where, in retrospect, you look back and you think, "Well, wow, what if they would have just got involved in the Soto talks?" What if they would have made that trade? And then they that oh we don't know if it would have come together in the same way. True, but like sometimes this stuff's just dropped on your lap before you're ready for it. Yeah. Yes. I. It's just a weird. It's a weird t- roster. <laughs> it's. Bieber is entering a walk year and is just has the looks of like a guy who's going to cash mm-hmm. in and have a great year. And he's looking across the clubhouse in there. And I don't mean to pick on De Los Santos because it's not his fault. He's in this position, but like that guy, it, it's unfair for him almost to be on a major league roster. He's 20 years old. Or I think about how, I mean, that rotation could be really good again, right? It's fragile, but it could be really good. And you're just going to, eh, well, we think next year is our year, actually. So we're going to wait till Jose Ramirez is a year <laughs> older and Shane Bieber's, yeah. Bieber's not here. Closer to the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> yeah. And you're just going to hope that, like, Joey Cantillo can pick up the slack or Xavion Curry, and then, yeah, I don't know. You, you have to take, you have to capitalize on the advantages or on the opportunities you're given. And I feel like sometimes they're slow to react. Like last year, okay, like the Savali for Manzardo trade is I think is going to work out great. But you should have recognized where you were earlier then and pulled the plug on Rosario and given Arias and Rocchio more of a chance to shine. You should have played Tyler Freeman more than once a week. Because maybe you would have already had an answer on center field or shortstop or something. I, I just... Hindsight's twenty twenty, but I feel like they are caught in such a weird spot. And it wouldn't have taken much because the Twins and Tigers, shame on them too, because they didn't do anything to seize control of the division. But the Guardians could have done that easily, and they didn't. And they're also the team that hasn't won since 1948. There's that too. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, I pulled this up earlier today. I found a a chart, a meme. I don't, I don't even know what this would be, but it was the Billboard Top Artist the last year. The Billboard Top Artist, the year each MLB team won its last World Series. So let's let's go through this. Taylor Swift with the Texas Rangers. Okay. <laughs> Bad Bunny, the Houston Astros. Okay. Drake, Atlanta Braves. Okay. Post Malone, LA Dodgers. Post Malone again with the Washington Nationals. Drake with the Red Sox. Adele with the Cubs. How about this? Taylor Swift with Kansas City. (laughs) Taylor Swift back when the Royals were world champions. One Direction, San Francisco. Adele, St. Louis. Taylor Swift again with the Yankees. Chris Brown with the Phillies. 50 Cent, 
with the, the White Sox and the Florida Marlins. Florida Marlins. Nelly with the Angels. Destiny's Child with the Diamondbacks. Garth Brooks, Toronto Blue Jays. Mariah Carey, Minnesota Twins. New Kids on the Block, Cincinnati Reds. Oakland Athletics, New Kids on the Block, again. Whitney Houston, the New York Mets. Lionel Richie, Detroit Tigers. Michael Jackson, Baltimore Orioles. Any guess as to where the the then Cleveland Indians who would have been the top billboard art artist? Well, my first guess would be someone Hayden Grove covers. Um, 1948. I'm trying to think, who was popular in 1948? Who was popular? Uh, of course, Tampa Bay, Milwaukee, San Diego, Seattle, Colorado. Not on this list yet. Yeah, in 1948, I remember my great grandfather telling me about how, when on his way to work every day, he would. Listen to uh, Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. So I, it's probably not them. I don't know if they had, they were number one. I'm going to go Margaret Whiting. Ding, 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 sir. <laughs> <laughs> I love I that someone, as you go. Someone sent that to me and then sent me a video of her singing Moonlight in Vermont. <laughs> Can't say I've... <laughs> Can't say I've heard that one. Mm, it's not, not on my playlist. I don't want to play it. I don't know if she would take the, you know, we'd have a YouTube strike from, from Margaret's family. I don't know. But as I, I chuckled and then I cried a little bit and maybe threw up in my mouth when I realized all of them are in color except for when you get all the way to Margaret at the end. <laughs> Why? But, uh, Did she perform at Super Bowl One <laughs> halftime show? <laughs> <laughs> the more important question is, who will be the Billboard top artist when the Guardians actually win this World, World Series? Are they even born yet? <laughs> Stop it. Uh, it. It could be your son. It could be your son. You well, said that he likes the belt. He likes the belt at the top of his lungs at in front of people at that's, a restaurant. That's, that's, so that's not singing. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Yet. Yet. Well, I, I will say it does feel like uh it it feels like it's a little bit closer to a reality when I dream of a lineup that features Chase DeLauder. But the key feature is wearing the jersey that everybody else is because you're not in minor league camp. You're actually on the big league team. <laughs> Again, today, everyone looking at the, hey, he didn't get sent down. No, because he that that's already happened. It's he, he doesn't have to get sent down. I, I'm not even saying that they could surprise us all and shock the world and put him on the opening day roster. They could, but they'd have to put him on the 40-man roster because he's not there right now. <laughs> You know how you always used to hear, oh, the Guardians didn't invite Shane Bieber to Big League Camp because they didn't want Tito and Carl Willis to to fall in love with him and beg for him to be on the opening day roster. And I'm trying to think, was it, was it, it was uh, last, last spring, remember Bybee and Williams were not in Big League Camp, similar reasoning, and Carl Willis like snuck out to go see them one day, I think. Um, and I know he was he was watching an Aaron Savali <laughs> side session or minor league game, oh. and he kept like peeking to Bybee throwing on the next field. Oh my it's, gosh! It's almost similar with Delauder, <laughs> but because he's hit so well, he's like they haven't been able to hide him from the coaching staff. Um, you know everything he's done is in front of all the guys who are going to be clamoring for him in May and June if. The outfield is just as ineffective as it was last year, but yeah, I mean, I part of this might be, you know, my fault for 
not helping to clear up confusion. I, I guess I didn't really have a good handle on what people knew or didn't know, but I could have maybe tweeted something at some point. But yeah, like Delauder's not on the in big league camp technically, so you're seeing players at this point in camp being reassigned or optioned every day. That that doesn't happen with him because he's already there. Um, so like the big league clubhouse at the beginning of camp had 62 players in it. He wasn't one of them. He was one of the 28, I think that were in like the minor league depth camp. So this is not the same, you know, it is impressive what he's done. If anything, it's, he's sped up his timeline. He's captured the attention of all the evaluators he needs to capture. And maybe it's more realistic for him to join the major league team before July than it was a month ago. I think that's absolutely fair to say. Um, but this was never like, this was the case all along. I, the most surprising thing to me maybe is that the, like the team has been promoting him a lot, like on social media. Right. I, I think you don't, you don't typically see that. Um, and I think that I'm not saying that that's like a directive from the front office. Like, Hey, you can, you can promote this kid now. Cause like, we'll we'll call him up soon. But I, it's just, it's, I think it's just it shows how impressive he's been because he's on the radar of everybody. And we do need to remember as impressive as he's been, it's been like 25 at bats. It's a tiny, tiny sample size. I don't want to be the, <laughs> I'm not trying to rain on your parade stop, but I just want to do the rock meme though. <laughs> <laughs> if, you know, if he goes three for 25 at some point during the season, by the same token, you shouldn't, or if he was three for 25 this spring, that shouldn't dampen your expectations for him. Um, okay, but it, it, it's human nature. You're going to get excited. Sure. But I am I am shocked that the team is promoting him as much as they are. I mean, do, they should be. That's the shocking thing. They're doing what they should be doing with someone that's having the sort of spring that he is and getting as much attention and looking the part and how about you know he takes the helmet off and the locks are flying and it's like this this dude not only is he, is he hitting like a superstar dude looks like a superstar he looks like just the face of your organization within a year i think year. how i, I mean, wanted that, to say this is he looks. i give them credit for doing that knowing everybody is going to reply saying put this guy on the roster why isn't he on the team why isn't he on the team um <laughs> like oakland but they never have to send the out the replies. tweet yeah, Oakland they, they turned the replies the off to all their tweets. You can't even <laughs> interact with them anymore. Um, they're obviously going through some I mean, stuff that's a little more serious, but I, I give the team credit because I remember the everybody wanting Bo Naylor to be up last summer and just spamming the team account with Bo Naylor's headshot. And I'm sure the same will happen with Manzardo and DeLauder, but at least they can promote him and know what's coming. I, I'm on to them. They they know they never have to send out the tweet that he's been reassigned. So right. They don't ever have to sidestep it. They, it never happened. What? It never happened. It was just full on memory stick you from Men in Black. That it, that it just <laughs> never happened because you never have to tweet about it. I mean, yes, promote the heck out of him because he's having an impressive spring. At the end of the day, does it really change the way he's going to perform in his career, the fact that he's had this great spring? No. Am I enjoying every bit of it? Yes. Has it at least elevated him to me feeling like he definitely belongs this year? Territory? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it's not even that I think this this means that it he's definitely a star or anything like that. But when this spring began, I, I thought, yeah, maybe we'll see him at some point this year. And I, I hope he has some success, but now it just feels like a death. Well, when he has success, we're going to be having a conversation about it later this year. And I'm getting teased because, of course, here's, here goes the team again. They play him in one of the games where he actually gets stat cast data. And what does this dude do? He homers. That's not even the best hit, the best exit velocity of the. He had two 110 mile per hour singles. On top of another homer, which I think was like 106 something. So I'm already salivating, and not that 110 is super extraordinary, but uh, a prospect having three balls over 100, a couple of 110s, and then a home run on the the only day that I get some stat cast data to dig into. 
it's just teasing me. It's just, it's sal- I, I, I'm salivating over here just thinking about the day that he's going to arrive. And it, it has done a lot. And that's really kind of the, what I want to come back to. It, this spring has just elevated him to, to a level that it's not a question of if, it's now a question of when for me. Yeah, I, I just think everything with this organization right now is timing. You have to be so perfect at lining everything up when you run the payrolls that they do, when you operate the way they do with trading players, the closer they get to free agency. Because you've got to hit, you've got to get everybody on that timeline where people aren't too expensive, so you can keep everybody, and they've got experience. You know, you're, you're the 17 rookies thing in 2022 is not the norm. You've got to get, okay, do we have a starting rotation that we can lean on that is young and is going to be here for a few years? Looks like it. At least four of the five, assuming Bieber leaves. Can you get the core hitters? Can you can you build this thing out so that Manzardo and DeLauder are not rookies? They're like contributing players who can go help you in a World Series while the pitchers are still here. That's you have to get all this timed up perfectly. That's that's kind of like what I was ranting about earlier with the Manzardo thing. It's just if he he looks right like I, Delauder, I understand you want to send him down. The guy's played six games above a ball. That doesn't mean you have to send him down for six months. You can send him down for a month, and if he's hitting four hundred wherever you send him, get him up. But Manzardo, like like he he's been a Triple A. Then he went to the Fall League and. He rebounded from an injury. He just, he looks ready. I, I don't know what he's going to accomplish at AAA, and I want him as close to, like you want to get to a point where you just write his name in the lineup every day, lefty or righty, and don't think about it. And you want to get to that point as soon as possible because you've still got Bybee and Williams and McKenzie and Allen really cheap. So you want to just build this, and you've got Jose Ramirez. He's never going to be younger than he is right this second, right? So... You just want to get all of this timed up perfectly to give yourself as many chances at being a playoff team as you can. And the sooner you act on those young players who are trying to tell you that they're ready, the better. Yeah, that's the the part that frustrates me is that you have two kids that look like they're ready, but you're denying them that chance. I get it more with DeLotter. We've had that conversation than I do with Manzardo. But on the other end of that spectrum, if I want to look at this with a glass half full, I'm super excited because two young players that really, I won't say make or break how I feel about 25, but kind of do. <laughs> they, they're really that important. They showed up. And as much as having some success in spring training is worth, they're doing it. And they're, as you have said, Many times over the past several weeks, they look the part. Manzardo, look, he looks like he belongs. He's not overmatched in the box. Yeah, pitchers are going to make adjustments to him, and he's going to have to prove you know, the, the high, fa- high fastballs and all the stuff that has been criticisms of him in the past facing lefties. Yeah, he's going to have to answer for that stuff, and he's not going to do it in spring training. But my God, And he's not going to do it in AAA. No, 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 he's not. Uh, but showing up and just mashing doesn't I feel like that just sets them up not only I'm sure they're feeling well physically but also mentally there's nothing standing in the way of just you having a nice easy start to the season for for whatever it's worth in spring training I know we have these conversations every spring with someone that has a great spring and then they come out of the gate and go two for their first first 34 I know that that happens but again we're, we're in March this is what we got and what I've what I've seen is two kids that don't look like they're far away, and I am super excited about the day that you're both they're both going to be in this lineup. And through this spring, it feels like that day is pretty darn close. It's different when it's your top two prospects doing that, as opposed to like Oscar Mercado or Tyler Naquin, who did that in the past. The other thing is, think about the the contrary here. The shortstop battle, like, no one has emerged. So, when you have an exciting development like this, clutch onto it. Dream. Better days. Better days ahead.
but the better days could be here right now. Not you know, for my bracket. Stopping that is, is, is the team itself. I'm sorry. Apologies for that. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Click subscribe down there. Like this video. Smash that share button and hitch your horses to some wagon. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>